Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we have our own uh, Grant Spickus to give us a talk, and uh, he, he will be telling us about the structure of linear hypergraph and null variant. Take us away, Grant. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, joint work with my advisor, Josh. Uh, so as always, thank you for all the continued help with everything. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about linear hypergraph null variety. Um, so I guess we should talk about what some of that stuff means. So all of this is going to be based on hypergraphs. So if you're not familiar with hypergraphs, uh, they, we take the just normal graphs, the edges connect to two vertices, and we relax that condition. Um, so if I have a hypergraph, the edges aren't, we don't require that they connect to two vertices. Uh, they can connect to any arbitrary subset of the vertices. Um, but in general, we think of, we want to talk about uniform hypergraphs, meaning that all of the edges connect the same number of vertices. So we can think about these edges as, as sets, subsets of the vertex that uh, we just we want to require that all of the sets have the same size, and we use k uh, to denote that, that common size. So we call hypergraphs k uniform if they satisfy that kind of condition. Uh, we're going to talk today about linear hyperpaths. Uh, there are a lot of places in literature where they're called loose hyperpaths as well. The terms can be used interchangeably. I'm going to stick to linear. Um, so if I have a k uniform linear hyperpath on n, n edges, I'm going to denote that with p subscript and superscript k. So what do those things look like? Well, they look like this. Um, naively, I think about just a path on graphs, and then I take each edge and blow it up into a, a, un, a k uniform edge on whatever k I'm interested in. Um, a little bit more rigorously, if I take n edges that all have the same uniformity, and then I just label them e1 through en, and then two consecutive edges intersect at one vertex, and any other pair of edges don't intersect at all. So that's how we can think of these, and here are a couple different. Um, so in each of these pictures, uh, each color represents one edge. So this is typically how we draw these kinds of things. Um, and we can think about these edges as like faces or, or shapes and we fill them in uh, accordingly. So here are some examples of linear hyperpaths. So I want to be able to talk about these things that I call null varieties. Um, and in order to do that, I, I need to talk about what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. But in order to talk about eigen, right, uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I need to have some kind of matrix or hypermatrix that we're going to associate those things to. Um, so in an effort to try to build up some definitions and terminology in order to do that, uh, we're going to look at hypermatrices. So graphs are nice. We can just look at, at matrices. Um, but what we're going to be able to do here in the hypergraph case is find some hypermatrix and associate it to our graphs. So we'll do that in a second. But what is a hypermatrix? So there are two properties or parameters that we associate to these things, the order and the dimension, okay? So the order, if I just have a matrix, we're gonna, that'll be a second order hypermatrix. So the order is just the number of sides that it has. Uh, every entry we can specify by uh, a tuple of coordinates. Um, so the number of coordinates that we need to specify a location, it's gonna be equal to the order of our hypermatrix. And uh, we're just gonna require that each of those entries be between one and whatever our choice is. So if we have a matrix, we have rows and columns, we can specify any entry by well, what row is it, what column is it, so it'd be a second order uh, hypermatrix in this way. Um, so that's how we kind of visualize this. So we can take this kind of idea and define a normalized adjacency hypermatrix for any hypergraph that we have. And now uh, the word normalized uh, included in there, we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. If we just think about graphs, we can define an adjacency matrix for a graph. Any entry of that matrix is gonna have an entry, uh, the value one, if the vertices that correspond to that entry are connected uh, or connected by one edge, they're, they're adjacent to one another and a zero otherwise. So the zero idea is gonna be preserved here for our normalized adjacency. The one is gonna be slightly different. Instead of having a one in an entry that corresponds to an edge, we're going to have one over k minus one factor. Now, the reason for doing that is uh, just kind of because we do it for aesthetic purposes. As you start to do computations with these objects, if we just use ones and zeros, then there's a bunch of k minus one factorials that fly around everywhere. Kind of convolutes the, the computation piece. Um, so in order to eliminate those and make the computation a little bit easier to work with, we kind of bake that normalization into the, the hypermatrix itself. Um, so maybe not a very satisfying answer as to why that's normalized in that way, but that's why we do it. Okay, so 
I have a hypergraph. I can talk about this tensor or hypermatrix that we have associated to it in this way. So now we have an object that we can talk about spectral things, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, so let's let's build up towards that. So I'm going to take some arbitrary vector complex entries in uh, n-dimensional space. So I have it in this way. I'm going to define two notations. I'm going to take uh, x, this vector, and raise it to an exponent. I'm going to define that in two different ways. Notation will be slightly different, but um, still a little confusing. So I'm going to take x to the m power, and this represents how we th usually think about exponents. Then that's going to correspond to another vector where the coordinate of this new vector is just the m power of the corresponding coordinate in the original vector. So I take my vector x1 through xn, and I raise that vector to the nth power. What that does is just takes each of the entries of the original vector x and raises it to the nth power. Okay, the second thing I want to define is uh, x again to a power, but now I have this, this O times intact or this outer product. And what this is going to do is instead of spitting out another vector, it's going to spit out a hypermatrix. Okay, the order of this hypermatrix is going to be the integer that occurs up in the exponent, so m in this case. And it's going to be an n-dimensional hypermatrix. The n comes from the size of the original vector. So we need to talk about what each of the entries of this hypermatrix look like. And uh, the indices for this entry that specify the location within our hypermatrix are going to specify the value that we choose. So we're just going to take the product of the corresponding entries in the original vector. So if I'm looking at the x1 through xm entry of my hypermatrix, that value is going to be filled in with x sub i1 times all the way up through x sub i1. So whatever values that we have there for our, our, uh, the indices in our entry, we're just going to take the product of those uh, components of our original vector. So we have two different kinds of products defined in this way. So if I take some hypermatrix, I can look now at eigenvalue eigenvector pairs. Just like we do for just normal matrices, eigenvalue is just some complex number. Uh, the vector is just some vector in our n-dimensional space. And uh, they're going to satisfy this eigenvalue equation. So on the left side, I have this outer product hypermatrix definition for the, the exponent. And on the right side, we just have this, this x to the m minus 1 is just another complex vector. So how do we understand this kind of thing? Well, look at that just in one second. But what we do is we're going we're gonna to specialize this a little bit. We're interested in our k-uniform hypergraphs. So in this context, the k, the uniformity of our hypergraph, is going to replace the order of the hypermatrix we're looking at. So m, uh, m minus 1 is going to become k minus 1. And the, the hypermatrix that we're interested in is the adjacency hypermatrix. So this is what the equation looks like for our, just our setting of hypergraphs. Now, um, what is that? OK, so the right side, it's a little bit easier to understand than the left. So the right side, that x to the k minus 1 is just the k minus first power of the vector defined as another complex vector. And we know how to scalar multiply, take a scalar and multiply it by a vector. So the right side, we just get some n-dimensional vector, where n is going to correspond to the number of vertices that are hypergraph. So that, the right side is maybe not too bad to understand. So if these two things are going to be equal for some choices of lambda and some choices of x, well, I better get a, a vector on the left side. So how does that work? Well, it can be a little complicated. I find it easiest to understand this when I look at a picture, at, a, at an actual physical example. So I'm going to choose a, hyper, uh, a hypergraph here. So I, I've kind of, from the original pictures that I showed you on the first slide, I've kind of turned it a little bit. But really, this is just a three uniform linear hyperpath on two edges. I've just taken the pictures the way I oriented on the first slide. I kind of turned it um, so I have five vertices. So any of these vectors that I'm interested in are going to be five-dimensional. OK, so I choose some five-dimensional uh, vector with complex entries, and I can think of it as a vertex vector. So if I label my vertices as 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, if I number them in that way, then I can assign the corresponding entry of this vector that I've chosen to each of these vertices in this kind of way. And then what I can do is I can look at what happens when I take this product of my uh, adjacency hypermatrix A with the outer product of this vector X. So what that does is it takes the original vertex labeling that I have and creates a new one. 
And the way it does this is, is in the following way. So a little bit of vertex. Maybe I look at this, this middle third vertex, for example. I'm going to get one term for each edge that's incident to this vertex. So again, if we're looking at this middle vertex, then I have a red edge and a blue edge that are both incident to this third vertex. And on each edge, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the product of the other label. So on the red edge, I'm going to take x1 times x2. And on the blue edge, I'm going to take x4 times x5. I'm going to take this product over all of the edges that are incident to this vertex that I've chosen, and then add all those things. And that's the new labeling that I get after I look at this, this product. Okay, so actually trying to define that product algebraically is, can be a little bit convoluted with symbol pushing and whatnot, but that's how we can understand it uh, with, with a picture. Okay, same idea applies to every other vertex. It's just we don't see that there's a sum because there's only one edge that's adjacent, that's incident to any of the other four. X, the, the first, second, fourth, and fifth vertices are all do we want. There's only one edge that's incident to each of those. So we're taking a sum over one thing. And that thing for the fourth vertex, for example, is the product of the other two labels. So that's the x3 times x5. Okay, and that same process gets followed up. Okay. So what if I make some choices of some vectors? I can see what happens here. We can examine what happens. So maybe I choose my vector to be 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 1. I can assign the labels in this way. And then I can figure out what I get after I take this product that was on the left hand side of our original. Okay, so uh, the top left, the first vertex, the new label is going to be the second label, the top right, times the third label. Now that's a zero. And if you work through the rest of them, you get zeros everywhere else as well. Okay, so in this way, I call the original vector, we're going to call that a null vector. Just means that it's an eigenvector for the eigenvalue of zero. Okay. So this, this choice of vector, 1, negative 1, 0, 1, 1, is a null vector for the second. Okay, well, what if I make a different choice? Maybe I choose 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, assign the, the vertex labeling to the original picture. Look at what happens when I take AX squared. And you think about it for just a second. We're going to get all the zero again. All right, great. So this 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 is another complex vector, which happens to be a null vector for our graph. Okay, fine. When is the interesting part? Right? Let's add them together. Okay, so if I'm if I'm careful about taking these first two choices and adding them together coordinate wise, I get this this vector here: one negative one, and then one the rest of the way. I can assign that. Now, again, let's look at the, that first the first vertex. What's going to happen when I look at the product a x squared? Well, the new label is going to be x two times x three. Our x two is negative one, and our x three is positive. The last time I checked, that's not zero. It's negative one. So if we look at what we get when we look at this product, we get that, which isn't the all zero label, which is fine. What that's saying is that this choice of vector is not an all vector for this vector, which is fine, but it's kind of disappointing. Because again, how did we obtain this third vector? Well, we took the first two and added them together. If I took a linear combination of these first two null vectors, and I don't get an all vector. Which is unfortunate, but so it goes. So I'm going to use this lovely notation, v sub lambda superscript with my hypergraph, to denote the collection of all eigenvectors of the hypergraph G associated to the eigenvalue lambda. Okay, and I want to examine what do we know about this step? Okay, so uh, when we just saw that it's not closed under arbitrary linear combination, which is unfortunate because in the graph case it is. Okay, these, these collections of eigenvectors for the graph case form vector spaces, we call them eigenspaces. They have really nice properties. There's a, a really rich spectral graph theory that we can look at as it pertains to these kinds of objects. Uh, we have no such luck in the general hypergraph. So, okay, fine. We don't have closure under arbitrary linear combinations. So we don't get vector spaces, but what do we get? Well, it turns out we get varieties. And if you're not familiar with varieties, they're just, Simultaneous zero sets of some set of polynomials. So I give you some polynomials, ask you whether they're all zero, put that together, form a set with all of those values, all those vectors, and it gets what we call a variety. Okay. So varieties are just simultaneous zero sets of some collection of polynomials. Okay, but what polynomials? So how does this, how does this even work? 
So we're going to use this script D to denote the variety defined by, and then this big argument is just going to be some set or some list of polynomials. So then what this, this notation on the right is going to describe is all of the, the vectors or all of the, the points. And for us here, it's going to be five dimensional space because of the example we just looked at. But all of the points in five dimensional space that correspond to zeros of all of the polynomials that I so this is what this object here is. Okay, so in this example we just looked at, this is the variety that we're interested in. But why? Why does this make any sense? Where does this come from? Well, think about the vertex label that we get from the product on the first vertex. It was the x2 times x3. Okay, on the second vertex, it was the x1 times x3. And then we see those terms that show up for each of those five vertices. And then where does this other piece come from? Well, I'll think all the way back to the original eigenvalue eigenvector. The right side was that lambda times x to the, the q minus first power. We're thinking at the moment about these three uniform things, the k minus one q. So if I just take my vector, square each of the coordinates, and scale and multiply it by lambda, then the new vector I get is going to be lambda x1 squared, lambda x2 squared, so on and so forth. That's where these pieces come from. So in order for us to have an eigenvalue eigenvector pair, both of those vectors that we get have to be equal. And what does it mean for two vectors to be equal? Well, the corresponding entries are there. So we need x2, x3 to equal lambda x1 squared. We need x1, x3 to equal lambda x2 squared, so on and so forth. But if I just subtract the lambda pick your variable squared to the other side, I get these objects, and they all equal zero. So I'm interested in the simultaneous zero set of all of the equations that, that we get now. Okay. So what kind of structure do these objects have? So if I just give you some positive integer, you can factor it. You can break it down into a product of its, of its prime factors, whatever one does. And in a lot of areas of math, there's somehow more information that we can determine from that factorization than in the original integer that I gave. So if I look at ideals in a ring, you can do the same kind of thing. Now you have to know what it means to have a prime ideal or things like that, but you can take an ideal and you can decompose it into product of prime ideals. In that kind of way, there's a very, very strong correspondence between ideals and varieties. So because we can take ideals and kind of break them up into a product of its prime pieces, we can do the same kind of thing on varieties. So what that's going to look like for us is we can take a variety and express it as a union of irreducible components. That's the big fancy way to talk about it. Think about prime numbers is the same as like irreducible components when it comes to varieties. Okay. And our multiplication to get us integers is going to correspond to unions for our varieties. Uh, what exactly it means to be an irreducible component, I'm going to kind of just brush on this stuff. Okay. I'm not going to go into the, the algebraic geometry of what exactly that means. Uh, we can talk about it later if you want. Um, but just the idea here is that I want to somehow take my variety and break it down into its small in decomposable pieces. Okay, so what is that going to look like and how do we do that? Well, I want to start with the most basic case that we can. So graphs are the same thing as two uniform hypergraphs. So bump that up by one, we get three uniform. The smallest linear hypergraph that we can talk about is going to have one edge in it. And if I look at all of these polynomials and I make lambda zero, that's going to somehow reduce this even farther and make it somehow easier to work. Okay, that's assuming that zero is an eigenvalue for some eigenvector. And uh, for all of these examples, it's going to be. Right? So I'm going to just take lambda to be zero. And that reduces this a little bit farther. And hopefully, it's going to make it easier for us to talk about to understand this thing. So that's the case I'm going to consider. Okay, And then we'll consider two edges. And we'll go from there. OK, so if I have one edge, I assume my, my eigenvalue is zero. And I have three uniform. Then the variety that I'm interested in are the simultaneous zeros of x1, x2, x1, x3, and x2, x3. Because so I just have one edge, it looks like a triangle. And I label them x1, x2, x3. So there's just one edge, and I'm the, the new label that I get is just taking the product of the other two. So there's x1, x2, x1, x3, and x2, x3. So I want to know where all three of these polynomials are zero. So the variety that I'm interested in in is defined in this way. So I'm interested in places where x1, x2 is 0, 
and x1, x3 is 0, and x2, x3 is 0. But this variety is just a set. So when we think about and in terms of sets, we're thinking about intersections. So if you've worked with varieties at all, there's some nice, nice ways that we can break them up and work with them. This is one of the things. If I have a variety defined on a couple different polynomials, well, that's the same thing as the intersection of each of them. So I can break that up in this way. And then uh, look at the first one. I have x1 times x2 is 0. And uh, we, we scream at our college algebra kids until we're blue at the face that if I have a product of two things which is 0, well, then one or both better be 0. So I can break this up. So if x1 times x2 is 0, well, then either x1 is 0 or x2 is 0. Maybe but one or the other. So, or when we think about set theory, it's going to break up into a unit. So the variety of, uh, defined on the polynomial x1, x2 is the union of the variety on each of those variables. So I get something like this. And uh, depending on how good or not your set theory ideas are, uh, how do we work with something like this? Well, I think about it like uh, distributing polynomials. I think about intersection as multiplication. I think about union as addition. So I have three binomials that I'm distributing. So we get a, a term of that expansion for every choice of a monomial in the, the first polynomial and then the second and the third. Same kind of deal here. So this is the union over the intersection of a choice from each of the three bars. And it turns out that the ones that I'm interested in are the ones that impose the smallest number of conditions. What do I mean? So I can choose the variety defined by x1 in the first group. I can choose it again in the second group. And then in the third group, well, I have to choose something else. But there are two variables that I get, two polynomials that I get in the set. So I can get uh, the variety uh, defined by x1, intersected with the variety defined by x1, intersected with the variety defined by x2. And then there's two conditions. I, I require that x1 is 0. I require that x2 is 0. Two conditions. I mean, there are other terms that I can get in this expansion where I get all three. So I could, again, pick x1 in the first one. I could pick x3, and then I could pick x2. But now I've imposed more conditions. So if I require that x1 and x2 are both 0, well, then x3 is, is free. But if I require that all three of them are 0, well, then I'm somehow restricting myself. OK, so when I union those together, more restrictions you kind of get lost. To get right. So what I'm interested in here are the smallest number of restrictions that I can get for these terms. And when I do that, we well, get every choice of two of them. And then I'm also kind of baking into this line and just taking this kind of thing. If I take the intersection of, of varieties, then that's the same as the variety of just delimit them by Thomas. Okay. So these are the pieces that we get. And uh, so this is actually a, a decomposition of the original variety and irreducible component. Again, whatever irreducible component is. Um, so it's actually pretty easy to, to show that each of those are irreducible. We're in three-dimensional space. Just think about it as x, y, z. This is saying that x is 0, y is 0. So it's the z axis. This is saying that x is 0 and z is 0. So it's the y axis. So these three things are just the axes of three-dimensional space. Okay. So uh, great. We've done it for one edge. And the next hardest thing is two. We've already seen these polynomials. We care about when they're all 0. So if I look at the first one, x1 times x3 is 0. So either x1 is 0 or x3 is 0. You can perform that same kind of analysis for everything except the third one, because I have a sum, a non-trivial sum. So I have a bunch of x3s all over the place. So if I take x3 to be 0, then I satisfy the first equation, I satisfy the second, the fourth, and the fifth. And the only thing left is this third one. So if x3 is 0, then I also have to require that x1, x2 plus x4 is 0. OK? You might say, well, that's just, is that just the same as saying that x1 and x4 are 0, or just taking one from each of these terms and requiring it to be 0? Not necessarily. Remember that maybe this product could be 1, and this product is negative 1. So they add to 0. So that's not, that's weaker than requiring that two of these variables, one from each piece. OK, so I have two conditions here. Now, what if x3 is non-zero? Well, from the first, second, fourth, and fifth equations, the other variables better be. So if x3 is non-zero, the first one tells us x1 is, and so on. OK, so this, in some way, kind of discusses every case. Clearly, either x3 is 0 or not. And in these situations, we kind of get just one consequence. So the irreducible components of 
the null variety for the two edge for uniform linear hyperpolar. The irreducible components are going to be these two things. So what I'm saying is that if I take these two varieties and union them together, I get back the, the whole thing. Okay. So there's the two edge. And we can do this all day, right? Induction says we could just keep on going and going. Uh, it gets harder as we start building up edges. So it'd be really great if we could do a jump. Okay. Uh, it turns out we can. Uh, and it's, I don't know, maybe Josh here disagrees, but I think it's kind of pretty. <laughs> it's not pretty, I don't think. I don't think it's a pretty argument at all. But we can do it generally. Um, so if I have a three uniform linear hyperpath on n edges, then that thing is 2n plus 1 vertical. So you could draw a picture and convince yourself of it. Um, but I'm going to let m be that constant so it's easier to work with. OK, so what does it mean if I have uh, some vector which is a null vector for, for this general for uniform linear hyperpath. Well, it's going to be an m dimensional vector, same dimension as the number of vertices that I have. I'm just going to let the, the i entry be xi, just like we've seen already. Here's our picture where I don't know how much we have in the middle. Okay, but we get something like this. And then here's where it's maybe a little easier to see that I'm uh, two times n plus one vertical. So here I get two, here I get two, I get two from each of the edges. And then when I get to the end, I have to account for that. Okay, so uh, if I label my vertices in this way, then I can take my vector and assign it as a vertex labeling. And then we want to look at what uh, the action of taking the adjacency hypermetric multiplied by this vector outer product of itself, what that actually does. And what that gives us is something I believe it looks like this. Okay, so I get a new vertex labeling. Again, I'm taking this for any particular vertex, I'm taking the sum over the edges that are incident to it or the product of the other. Or other vertices. So for this third vertex, for example, I'm going to get x1, x2 times x4, x5. And that's what I have here. And when you write it out normally, it doesn't look like this. That's why it's written in this way. Okay, just a hundred. Okay. Uh, the top vertices are maybe a little bit easier because they have degree one. So there's only one term here to consider. So if I just look at the top there, just for example, I have these product of odd index variables. And because I'm interested at the moment in these null vectors, this needs to be zero. So x1 times x3 needs to be zero. So either x1 or x3 is zero. You can do the same kind of thing the whole way through. So if you just look at the variables that have odd index, there can't be two consecutive of them that are both non-zero. Because if you do that, so if three and five, for example, were non-zero, well, then their product would be as well. And that's an issue. So you can start from that, that statement, and kind of build everything from there. That's what we're going to do. Um, so I'm going to take some null vector. And from that little argument, we can see that if I just look at the odd index entries, then no two consecutive of them can be known. OK, so what does that look like? What does that do for us? So I'm going to let this script x be the collection of all my variables. And I'm going to let x sub o the odd ones. Okay, so these are all of the variables that have odd index. Okay, uh, so again, whatever null vector I pick, no two consecutive things in x0 ordered by the index, the ordered number. No two consecutive of them uh, can be non zero. So if we're thinking about varieties defined by some polynomials, then what I'm saying is that any set that defines an irreducible component has to contain at least one of every consecutive pair of these odd indexed variables. So then what we're going to do is we're going to use those collections of variables as, as a starting point and build everything else from there. So how's that going to work? So I'm going to let SM be the collections of all, so I'm going to take the odd images, okay? And I'm going to let S be a subset of those odd integers so that it includes at least one of every consecutive. Like what we're interested in at the moment. I'm going to let this SM be the collection of all such S. Okay, so I have that. Uh, and it's maybe not uh, imperative for the proof, but worth noting that these sets or the, the size of these collections are counted by the Fibonacci. Okay, so 
Fibonacci, they're, they're easy in terms for us combinatorially because we can look at them recursively. There are well-known recurrences that define the, the Fibonacci numbers and objects that are counted by those Fibonacci numbers. So in the actual proof of this stuff, uh, those recurrences are actually very helpful in terms of ultimately we'll count these. Okay, so that'll be that's a something worth noting, but not necessarily uh, necessary for us at the moment. So I have these collections of subsets of the odd integers, which don't omit two consecutive. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate sets of polynomials, which give us irreducible components of our null variety from these things as a starting. Okay. I'm going to let B be the thing that I generate. So I'm going to generate a collection of polynomials from the starting point, the starting set. I'm going to let B be the set of polynomials that I generate. And uh, uh, eventually we'll let script be the collection of polynomials. But before we do that, there's one little extra thing that I want to define. These polynomials P sub and index look like this. So if we go all the way back to the first example we saw, that the, the, uh, the two edge free uniform hyperbola. The third vertex level was the x1, x2 plus x4, x5. That's the polynomials of that form for the same set of machines. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to call it P sub. That example would be P. Okay. So I want to be able to talk about these things and not have to write out all of that. Well, um, these are the conditions. Okay. Uh, actually, understanding exactly what they say is maybe not the most important thing. But we have this list of like six conditions or so, which allow us to go from a set S that I've chosen to the set of polynomials that I'm interested in, I call it B. And if I do this, this process for all of my sets in that collection we've considered, I'm going to call that collection of these new polynomial sets. I'm going to call that script B. Okay, see so if you're very careful about it, you can go through and uh, put these conditions on things and see the sets. Okay, so what we actually see is that the null variety that we're interested in is actually the union over all of the, the Bs in my script B of the variety defined on that set of points. Take, the, take this collection script B, look at each element, each set of polynomials that's in there, define the variety on that set, union all those things together, and I get my null variety. That's how this is going to end up working. Uh, so I've, I've glossed over what it means for a variety to be reducible, um, but each of these varieties is going to be reducible, whatever that means. Um, so the definition itself is obviously important, but we're not going to talk about it. So you just, I guess, kind of take my word for it that each of those are reducible. Okay. Now there's one little thing. Like what we talked about in the uh, in the single edge case, we had uh, the intersection of reunions, and we talked about distributing those things. But we only cared about some of the pieces that we got. Some of them employed extra conditions, and well, they're kind of included in what we already have, so we don't we don't worry about these things. So we're only interested in the the pieces of this, or the varieties that we get in this union that are actually maximal. By what we mean is, if we have one that's included in another. Well, we don't care about the small one because it's kind of engulfed by the larger. So we want to be able to talk about which ones in this unit are actually maximal. We'll keep those and we'll throw out the rest because the rest are kind of just external. So as it turns out, that if I define this theta b, so if I take a b out of my script b, I can define theta b to the collection be the collection of maximal sets of consecutive odd index variables. Okay, so if I have Maybe if I, I have B, which is like X3, X5, X7, and then X11, then I'm going to throw out one in the last one, but assume that those are outside what I said. Okay, one of my collections is going to be X3, X5, X7, and the other one's going to be X11. I'm just going to take the maximal sets of consecutive odd index, just variables that are in this collection B. Okay, and as it turns out, that the ones, the, the varieties that are actually maximal, are the ones that don't include a set in here of odd cardinality, at least. Again, the proof of that one's not too final. So this is the result. I'm going to omit the proof. Um, but it's what I'm trying to illustrate is that it's possible to talk about the ones that are maximal 
under this inclusion relation, then we can take the union over. And then that's going to be a decomposition of our variety into its irreducible. So this whole algorithm idea can be a little bit hard to follow. So we looked at the one edge case, the two edge case. The five edge case, there's actually, uh, what do we have here? I think 11 different pieces here. Uh, now I've, I've denoted them with the angle brackets. So really I'm thinking about them as an ideal at this point. Um, but I, if I take the variety defined on each of these ideals, union them together, that's gonna be a decomposition of the null variety for the, the five edge three uniform case. Um, and that's a one edge case. Okay. Okay, so we can talk about dimension or co-dimension for these things. So if I have some, some space, n-dimensional complex space, and I look at some set in that space, I can look at its dimension. Uh, co-dimension is just the size of the whole space minus its dimension. So it turns out that based on the construction of these, these um, varieties, because we just have variables and then these very special little polynomials as well, it turns out that the co-dimension is actually equal to the number of polynomials in so it's very easy, given one of those ideals, to talk about the co-dimension of the variety. And it's equally as easy to talk about its dimension. Take the size of the whole space, track off the co-dimension. So uh, we have some way to construct all of the, the pieces that give us irreducible components. And we can talk about the co-dimension or the dimension of each of those. So from this, what do we like to do in common terms? We want to construct an right? So that's what we have here, two variables, okay? Uh, the exponent on Z is going to be the number of edges in the linear hyperpath we're considering. And uh, the exponent on Y is going to be the dimension of the irreducible components we're talking about. The coefficient is going to be the number. So the number of irreducible components of uh, the three uniform linear hyperpath on N edges that have a particular dimension, generating functions given by this. Okay, what does it do for us? Why do we care about this stuff? Well, so why, why is this interesting in any way? So we can think about eigenvalues in a different way. We can talk about the characteristic polynomial of a hypergraph, just like we do for just general graphs. We define it as the characteristic polynomial of our adjacent matrix. There's a way to define characteristic polynomials for hypermatrix. Okay, uh, resultant of, it's a multi-polynomial multi result. So exactly how we come up with these things I'm not going to go into, um, but it's possible to define a characteristic polynomial for a hypermatrix, ergo a hypergraph. So these eigenvalues that we get in this way are the exact same collection of complex numbers that we get for roots of the characteristic polynomial. So because of this, we can look at two different multiplicities of these eigenvalues. One being the multiplicity of the root for the characteristic polynomial. So like if I have x, so we have zero as an eigenvalue then x to what power divides the characteristic component? That largest exponent is going to be our algebraic. Whereas the geometric multiplicity is going to look at the, the dimension of our eigenvalue. Okay. So we have two different notions. For graphs, they agree. All nice. For hypergraphs, they don't. And uh, one kind of handy way we to see that is the degree of these characteristic polynomials gets large quickly. Whereas exponentially in n and k, where n is the number of vertices, k is the uniformity. Whereas if we think about these eigenvarieties, well, they live in n dimensional complex space. So their dimension is at most n, it's bounded above by the number of vertices. Whereas the algebraic, so the degree of the characteristic polynomial is large. And as it turns out, these characteristic polynomials have relatively few distinct roots. So all of these roots have really high multiples relative to the number of vertices. Um, so the algebraic multiplicity grows quickly as n grows, whereas the geometric multiplicity doesn't. It's relatively common. It's just growing as the number of roots. It's linear in the number of roots, whereas algebraic is not. Okay. So these two things aren't the same for hypergraphs. What relations, if any, do we have? So uh, here in E, five years ago, published a paper which held a conjecture between the geometrics that, that tried to relate the geometric structure and some formula based on that and tried to relate it to the algebraic. 
they do it in this way. So they take the eigenvariety, and they break it down to its irreducible component, and they guess, they conjecture that this sum over the irreducible components of the dimension of the component times the uniformity of the hypergraph minus one to the dimension minus one, they conjecture that that's upper bounded by the algebraic complexity of the root of the system. Very little explanation as to why. They don't verify it for anything. They say, well, here you go. So uh, it would be really, really nice to maybe verify this, maybe for some cases, uh, maybe even prove it's not true or prove something stronger. So that's what all of this stuff is in an effort to do. So we look at these three uniform linear hyperpaths. We fully understand the number of irreducible components that have the different dimensions. So we can compute the left side of this equation. It would be great if we knew the algebraic model. Takes a little bit of work, a lot of symbol pushing, but it's possible. So uh, some work of Ban Fao Wang and Zhu uh, published last year defines the characteristic polynomials for these linear hyperpads recursively. So if you're really, really careful about crossing your teeth and dotting on your eyes to reduce your recursions, it's possible to come up with an exact formula for the algebraic multiplicity of zero for any of these characteristics. So I'm going to denote, so for the uh, K uniform linear hyperpath on N edges. I'm going to denote the algebraic multiplicity of zero, the degree, by dn. Okay. I'm also going to let u be k minus one to the k minus one. I'm going to let v be k to the k minus two. And the reason I do that is because I want the formula to fit all in one line. Okay, so there's the formula which expresses, which which finds or computes the algebraic multiplicity of zero. So something like that. Okay, so now we know both sides of this supposed inequality. Uh, we can go about verifying it. So uh, to make our work a little bit easier, we can take the generating function that we had previously in terms of the two variables and convert it to a generating function for this finite sum that we're interested in. If you think about it for just a second, you can differentiate in terms of y. And what that does is it takes the dimension of these ir irreducible components and brings it down front as a multiplier and subtracts one from the exponent, which gets us the form that we want and just plug in k minus one for y. And then it gets us a, a one variable generating function. Uh, we have to change the first couple coefficients to make it all work out. Um, but it's possible to get a generating function for the left side. So we have an explicit formula for the right, a generating function for the left. Uh, so again, not too bad to verify the conjecture, but it actually holds in this particular situation. So that's nice. We verified the conjecture for one very small, very narrow case. Okay. Um, but in all reality, this algebraic multiplicity, if you look at it asymptotically and finally, it grows like n times four to the n. But the sum on the other side of the inequality grows like 2.7 to the n. So we wonder if something stronger is true. Um, but it's hard to say at this point, because this is, this is all we have to go on. Um, so we know that this, the, the structure of these null varieties for linear hyperpaths, three uniform, that's it. So it'd be great if we could find some other decompositions for other classes of hypergraphs to get us some more information to be able to say, well, is this to be able to say something more specific about this conjecture? Is it true all the time? Is it not true? Is it true, but uninteresting because this stronger thing is true? Um, so that's where we're at at the moment. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you all for, for coming and listening. And thank you. All right, if we could all thank Grant for an excellent talk. And uh, are there any questions for our speaker? What is the meaning of this conjectured inequality? So somebody would not uh, conjecture such a thing randomly. It might mean something. Yeah, uh, great question, Laszlo. So um, yeah, he's referencing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the brief um, idea that they get behind this is that in some way or another, taking this sum over just the dimension of the whole variety. So if I take the sum over the irreducible components, but instead of looking at the dimension of each piece, I look at the dimension of the whole space, then this thing should somehow be an, a lower bound for the algebraic multiplicity. So if 
in each of those pieces, instead of looking at using the dimension of the whole thing, you just use the dimension of the irreducible component, which is bounded above by the dimension of the whole thing. And this should still hold. It'll be weaker, but it should still hold. So that's the brief motivation that they provide um, for that. But the exact reason why replacing the dimension of each of the irreducible components with the dimension of the whole space, why that's upper bounded by the algebraic multiplicity, I'm not exactly sure. Thank you. Great question. Thank you, Lazarus. And I could elaborate a little bit on one aspect of that, which is that if you notice the sum ends are these n k minus one to the n minus one things that are the degrees of the characteristic polynomial. So that that's clearly playing a role, but yeah, they just it's not really motivated. Yeah. I'm not sure. And I could tell you when this was run by an algebraic geometer, you look at us cross-eyed. <laughs> um, because it, yeah. Yeah. Seems to come out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, I have two questions for clarification. Um, yeah. Hello. Um, Hi, Tony. Um, yes. Um, hello from Kutztown University. Yeah, um, um, oh, Tony. <laughs> um, so on, on page uh, 15, or I think slide 15, uh, just a clarification, no, no, sorry, 16 then. Um, yes, uh, do you mean um, K-uniform, uh, like complete K-uniform hypergraphs on n vertices, like the last line? Because uh, it just it's, it's just generally, Tony. So if I take any K-uniform hypergraph on n vertices, then the degree of the characteristic polynomial is a constant, and it's that okay. constant. Oh, okay. I see. Okay, got you. And then the other thing I want to ask is like on second last line or something like that, like 18 or 19, you have some square brackets and I have no idea. Yes, that's right. BNK, like are they standing for something special? No, they're, they're just, uh, they're still just treat them as parentheses, Tony. They're, I just do that okay. so that I have the right number of, so if I have all these parentheses that are open, it's, it's going to be my luck that I don't close the right number of them. So I just do it to help me so you think okay. it's easier. Yeah. Cool. Sure. Thank you. I just yeah. like one. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. I didn't know. Maybe the inner one should be ordinary parentheses. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But yeah, you just treat them all as parentheses. All right. Uh, any other questions for Grant? Okay, if not, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, have a great weekend.